Today's short lesson is about life in Europe during the 18th century, the 1700s. And um, in today's short lesson, we're going to be focusing on the differences of the lives of the peasants versus the aristocracy. The aristocracy, of course, referring to the nobility or the people who are high class across Europe. And I'm also going to talk a bit about how lives of people in Northwestern Europe in places like Britain and France um, were different from the lives of peasants and uh, ar aristocracy uh, over in Eastern Europe in places like, for instance, Poland or Russia. And so um, what I'm going to do is I have a PowerPoint that I, a short PowerPoint that I've prepared today uh, to show you some stuff on this. And I'm going to go actually over to desktop view so that you can... Um, see this PowerPoint. So right now you should be able to see my desktop. Um, and here's my little PowerPoint that I created. And I'll try and make sure that I go back and answer questions um, either on the Q&A section of the uh, what you call it, um, Q&A section of the Google Live Hangout, which is right here. Um, and then between the, the questions on the other thing here. So here we go. Um, here is the PowerPoint slideshow from beginning. Okay. Um, I'm going to start this off. This is called life in the old regime. The old regime is a term that refers to the social makeup of 17, uh, 1700s uh, Europe. And the old regime is basically you've got kind of three different classes of people that live in this time. You might broadly categorize them into aristocracy which would be your landed nobles, people who have special titles like Earl or Duke or Duchess or whatever. Typically, they're men, though. So you've got proper nobles like that. Then you've got a kind of a middling group of people who we might refer to as urban dwellers, people who live in urban areas. And some of these urban dwellers are going to be relatively well off, merchants, artisans, and things of that nature. Uh, but a lot of urban dwellers at this time are kind of just middling class folks. Um, they are not landed, most of them. Um, they might be quite wealthy, though. And uh, this is the class of people who, during when we were talking about the age of absolutism, they're the class of people who were most likely, if they were wealthy middling folks, to be able to purchase, particularly in France, um, their right to nobility of the robe. Um, which would exempt them or, or disinclude them from any from having to pay any further taxes, which the middle class in the in the urban areas had a tendency to have to pay exorbitantly high taxes because they were not landed nobility. And then the third group of people, of course, would be the peasantry, which is also the largest group of people in Europe at this time, as we talked about in class today. The peasantry makes up a good solid 80% of the people in Europe and in some places as much as 90%. But um, life in the old regime, uh, was it this right here? As I'm sure you could imagine, this image here is not probably how most people spent living their lives uh, in 1700s Europe. You don't have this. By the way, this is a great example of Rococo style of art, O-O-R-O-C-O-C-O. -O -O -O. It's the type of art that kind of... Um, uh, succeeded or came just after uh, Baroque style of art. Rococo art kind of have, has this very light, airy, elegant feel to it. It's often outdoor scenes like this where you have these beautiful fountains and landscapes and people with this wonderful dress and, oh, look at me, I'm holding a tea kettle or whatever this thing is over here. And oh my, life is just so wonderful because we're living in 1700s old regime Europe and we are nobility. Except for the fact that the majority of people in Europe did not live like this. Art 
at this time especially, reflects the, the lifestyles of the rich uh, nobles. And the, the rich nobles were, were not the majority of people. They made up maybe about 5 or 10% of the population. Uh, not even actually, but rich nobles made up between like one and five percent of the population. Um, your your kind of middling class made up to about ten percent of the population. But the good number of people living in Europe at this time are more living like this. And this is not quite as glamorous as the previous scene. This is another piece of art. It comes from the later 1700s. But this is your classic like peasant family. This woman doesn't even have shoes on down here. I'd like to draw your attention to that. The staple of the peasant diet was bread. Uh, they do have a little bit of wine here, it looks like. Um, oftentimes, peasants and nobles both drink wine and beer more frequently than they drink water because water was typically very unsanitary at this time and carried a number of different bacterial things and so on. It would make you sick to drink it. But the, uh, but the beer and the wine, because it's fermented and it's processed um, in a way that kills the bacteria um, or the bad bacteria, is safer to drink. Um, this is grandma here. She's obviously old and sitting in a chair. And here's a cat. That's not Harrison. Um, and then here you have this guy playing a little pipe flute thing. Um, and, uh, you know, the kids here dressed in quite different clothing than this clothing here. And I'd like to point out that actually there were a number of laws that were enacted during this time that made the social classes extremely distinct from one another. So much so that I'm not kidding, it would have been illegal for these peasants here, illegal against the law for them to wear clothing of the higher classes. That was a punishable crime to literally wear clothing above your class. So um, so peasants would never, even if they could have somehow made it themselves or found it or afforded it, which they never would have been able to do anyway, were not allowed to put this clothing on. Why? Because they're distinguishing between the classes and they are trying to preserve the <clears throat> integrity of the noble class, the, the aristocratic class. So most people did not like live like this. They lived much more like this. Um, major features of life at this time. Let's talk about major features of the old regime, the old social hierarchy. Um, there was pretty much a strong desire by most people, and when I say most people, I am including both peasants and nobility, to maintain tradition. In other words, while we just spent an entire unit prior to Thanksgiving talking about the Enlightenment, the Enlightenment was, like I was telling you in class, um, pretty much a byproduct of the wealthy middle-class bourgeoisie. And it really only took off um, to its full height in the year, uh, in the decades prior to the French Revolution, from about 16, um, excuse me, 1750 to about 1790 was the, was the greatest period of the Enlightenment, where all the greatest works are coming out from Voltaire and um, Diderot's encyclopedia and things like that. So the peasants, why do the peasants want to maintain tradition, Mr. Knight? Why, wouldn't they want to, wouldn't want to, they want to improve their status? The simple answer to that is no, because as I've told you in class many, many times, the peasants pretty much like the way that they live. While they might not be considered nobility and they might not be particularly educated, they live relatively carefree lives and they liked the lives that they lived they liked the predictability of the grievance procedures. A grievance procedure would be like, if you have a complaint about a neighbor or about a practice or that somebody treated you unfairly or whatever, um, grievance procedures were pretty much pretty customary. You know, they, they were pretty well known. Um, and, it, and while they might not have been promised things like due, due process of law or something, um, and they might not have been completely protected from cruel or unusual punishments, typically there was a known procedure for going about making a, a complaint, and you kind of felt at the end of it like your complaint was at least somewhat heard or maybe even resolved. Um, they also wanted to maintain their customary rights like hunting. I said that twice on there, and, and I didn't mean to do that, but it's, it's, it's worth mentioning because one of the major complaints of the peasants 
uh, in Britain particularly was after in 1819 uh, or 1817 or somewhere in that region, 1816 maybe, they passed a law called the Game Laws, which I talked about briefly in class today, where it made it illegal for peasants to go hunting because all of the animals that were on the landholders' um, property were property of that landholder, and so you could not go hunting. Um, they, they liked having access to particular lands. They liked the way that they lived, lived their lives, which was not as much work as you might think it was. Um, nobility wanted to maintain tradition because of that thing that I was talking about in class today known as entitlement. They feel very entitled to their political power, to their wealth, which was tied to their land ownership, land ownership and their particular titles. So they, I mean, when we say that somebody is entitled, literally these people have titles that they go by, Lord so-and-so or, or Earl such-and-such of so-and-so. You know, these people have particular titles, and the reason that they have titles is because they're entitled to them by way of birthright, particularly the eldest-born males. So neither the peasants nor the, nor the nobility in that, in that respect, neither of them really want to see anything change. The nobles are not interested in the Enlightenment because the Enlightenment is, is questioning their power. And, and it's, a, it's a movement that is trying to bring political power to people who traditionally have not held political power. The nobility has absolutely no interest in that happening. Um, both of them also, I should mention, disliked the expansion of the bureaucracies of the monarchies um, or in Britain, for instance, parliament, which was mostly made of gentry. Um, and, and the fact of the matter about that is that, generally speaking, um, the, the, the monarchy was distancing the nobles from, it, it particularly in absolutist um, monarchies, the, the monarchy was distancing the nobles by using these bureaucrats, what they called intendants or intendants in France. And um, they, they did not like that. Um, they liked being intimately involved in the political happenings. Now in Britain, you've got an interesting thing that occurs because um, uh, in Britain you have parliament. Now parliament is run by nobility. So um, parliament being a, a product of nobility, um, generally speaking, they, they are in favor of parliament, but, but no, but the peasants didn't particularly care for parliament. And so when I say both of them, meaning nobility and peasants dislike the bureaucracies of the monarchy, the nobles didn't dislike parliament because the nobles were parliament, but the peasants didn't like parliament because parliament was always interested in increasing their own power of the nobles. So, um, so the peasants really did not care for that. Um, I'm gonna hold. I'm gonna stop right here, and I'm gonna see if you guys have any major questions thus far. Um, screen is very blurry. Never mind. Okay, and then I'm gonna go over here. Uh, these are okay. So far, no questions, and we have 25 viewers. Wonderful. Okay. I am going to continue on and I will stop again in another few minutes to see if, if we have any other questions. <clears throat> this is a picture. Again, this is not most people's lives during the 1700s, okay? This is not how people live. A lot of the art of the 1700s, and you can see this is an actual painting here because of the cracks in the, um, in the canvas, but anyway, um, a lot of the a lot of the art of the 1700s is very romanticized, and, and what mean what I mean by that is that it's it is not how things were. Uh, this might have been a scene somewhere, but this was not how most people's lives were. Okay, major features of life continuing here. Uh, traditional economy, mostly agricultural. So when I say a traditional economy, this goes back to what my entire two-hour lecture in class was about today. And that's referring to the fact that the economy was, for the most part, particularly in the early part of the century, um, very traditional. It was agriculturally based. And by traditional, I mean a um, lot of subsistence farming, a lot of local farming that's done, self-supporting, and so on. As the century progresses, though, we see more and more and more commercial farming 
farming throughout the 1700s. And it starts in the late 1600s, particularly in, Nether in the Netherlands, um, and spreads to England. But for the most part, in a lot of places in Europe, most places in Europe have a pretty traditional agriculturally subsistence-based, production-based economy where you're producing your own food, you're producing your own clothing. I'm not going to get back into that, although I know, I know all of you know that I could go all the way back into that, but we'll save that for class another day. Few factories existed. Now, you guys think of a factory as being a, um, a place where people go and do a lot of hard labor and there's a bunch of machines and stuff in there. Those types of factories don't really start coming until the late 1700s. Most manufactured goods were made with handmade tools in basically small guild workshops or in, even in people's homes, really. People made stuff at home. Um, there, uh, you know, family businesses, it was, a, there was, it was a time of what they called a family economy. And, and this traditional family economy meant that kind of your parents were like the business owner operators and they made the stuff that they needed and they made things that other people wanted and maybe sold it to them, particularly in urban areas. You'd have people living there. They might not have owned land. They probably rented the place that they were living, but, um, but they would make stuff inside the house and then sell it. Um, and, and the family kind of operated as a, as a, as a staff would or a, a, set, a group of employees would at a factory. We don't see real large factories forming until the very late 1700s. And those are mostly in urban centers in Britain. Um, industrialization starts in Britain with textile factories. Medieval rank and patriarchy was still strongly prevalent. There were laws that, for, I, I mentioned this before, there were laws that forbade different social classes from wearing clothes from superior classes. No one really enjoyed individual rights. Here in America, we're all about indi individuality, right? Individual rights. I've got the right to wear whatever I wanna wear to school and blah, you can't tell me this. I have the right to say that. I, you have the right to remain silent. All these different rights that we have are, that are granted to us just by way of the fact that we are individuals. You can throw every notion about individual rights directly out the window in 1700s Europe. There was no such thing as individual rights. The only rights, quote unquote, that people enjoyed were basically um, privileges based upon the customs of whatever community to which they belong. So there were, you know, most people didn't view uh, France as being one national identity where everybody identifies themselves as French and they all enjoy the same rights as French people. It really did not work that way. People viewed themselves very rigidly in terms of where they were in the social hierarchy. Were they a peasant? Were they a middling class type of person? Were they a nobility member? Were they a member of the clergy? Um, and then whatever community they belonged to had a certain set of privileges that, that they were granted based upon that very local community to which they were a part of. There's another picture for you. So let's talk a bit about the aristocracy or the nobility. Um, I mentioned a moment ago that it makes up about one to 5%, around one, but it depended on where you were. Sometimes the nobility was only 1%. Like in France, nobility made up approximately, you know, two percent of the population. Clergy made up another one percent of the population. So maybe you'd say about two or three percent of the population total was nobility. But in some places, as little as one percent or as many as five percent of the population were nobles. Um, and in every single country, regardless of where you were, the nobility was always broadly speaking, broadly of the entire class. It was the wealthiest class. Now, that's not to say that there might have been a couple of people who were wealthy, middle-class, bourgeoisie merchants who eventually had more wealth than some nobles did, especially lesser nobles. But for the most part, the, the, if you're looking at the broad social class of nobility, they were much wealthier than any other class was on the whole. Um, they had the widest degree of social, political, and economic power of any other class in Europe by a long shot. In fact, most other classes were completely excluded from the political or economic process. So um, it goes without saying that nobility would have a lot more influence on um, political happenings. Well, the nobility, and I wanna mention this too, because this is worth mentioning. We've talked about how the nobility may have lost power. I don't wanna paint a picture like the poor nobles were 
oh my gosh, they were living in destitution. And, you know, don't get me wrong. In France, even during the absolutist era under Louis the Fourteenth, please don't think to yourself that nobles, oh, the poor nobles. No, they had way more power. They remained far more influential compared to the other classes, even though they might have been marginalized a bit by um, Louis the Fourteenth and uh, like other uh, kings as well. Um, they did not do manual labor. Most nobility lived what they called idle lives. Idle lives, meaning you didn't, you know, manual labor was seen as something that was, you know, beneath you if you were a noble. Um, if you, we think of this kind of an interesting fashion thing is like we think of having a tan today. You know, you want to be at least somewhat tan, have some color, some complexion, but um, uh, working outside is how you get a tan. And so nobility, if you think of like the fairest of them all, if you've ever heard of like, what was that, Snow White or Cinderella, I forget, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? They're not saying fairest as in like a judge and jury, okay? They're not talking about that kind of fair, all right? They're talking about the uh, fair-skinned, okay? Fair-skinned people, meaning light-skinned people. Uh, the, the whiter you were, that meant that the less time you spent outside, which meant that likely you were probably... Uh, some type of idle living noble. Um, nobles embraced the commercial spirit. So while they didn't want change, one thing that they did want to do was, or some, at least some nobles wanted to do, was expand their wealth, expand their privileges. Generally speaking, nobility is going to be conservative, meaning that they don't want change. They want to keep things traditional unless that change brings them more money. The nobles are fine with change so long as it increases their political and economic power, then they're fine with change. But any change that serves as a threat to their power is uh, not going to be something that they're supportive of. <clears throat> so there's this guy. This guy is like me asking out my first prom date. She's looking completely the other day. She's probably looking at the guy that she's planning on taking over here somewhere. This is me. I'm like, oh, hey, yeah, hi. I'll just read this book that I'm holding in my hand. Okay, let's move on. All right, British nobility. Most of um, both the House of Lords and the House of Commons was made up of noble families. So I'm, I'm speaking specifically to um, the Brits here, okay? And, and I want to mention something now. I better mention this before I move too much further. Some of you might be asking yourself, wait, how all of a sudden are we calling these folks British? When did they become British? Weren't they English just last unit? Yeah, well, um, there was this thing called the Act of Union that was passed in 1707 that brought together the um, kingdoms of England and Scotland and um, Northern Ireland, and it made them Great Britain. And so now we call them British, all right? And, and we still call them that. Um, and they controlled 25% of all arable land in, in England. So think about that for a second. That would be like if Congress, okay? Th think about this. This is really interesting. I wish I could see your guys' reactions on your face right now because I'm just staring at a screen. But think about if Congress was made up of nobility. And Congress controlled 25% of all of the arable land in the United States. Okay, 25% of all of the arable land in the United States. That is a huge amount of control over wealth and over land. Because remember, wealth is primarily tied to land. How much land you have is a direct indicator of how wealthy you are in this time. Um, wealth is not, it's not necessarily a product of how much quote unquote money you have. It's more a product of how much land you have titled to, you are entitled to. Um, some individual nobles controlled tens of thousands of acres. That's not me, that's not a typo. That's tens of thousands of acres of land. Um, I think there was a certain British noble that they talk about in the book in the House of Lords who controlled like 50,000 acres of land alone in Britain, which is, I mean, Britain's not that large. It's, it's not a very big country. So um, if you consider that, that's a tremendous amount of control over a, over a territory. Invested their wealth in commerce, canals, urban real estate, industrialism. The British nobility were making out like bandits during the 1700s, man. They were, they were just totally um, skyrocketing in terms of their investments and their wealth. Um, 
and that kind of in some level is one reason why the peasantry i mean you you start to see nobles who become or um, parliamentary members of parliament mps who become really concerned with how wealthy parliament is becoming because they're worried that that the the continuing divide between the poor poorer folks in britain and the nobility in britain is going to create a revolutionary type scenario but it doesn't because one of the things that they realize is that if they make concessions through laws like you know repealing certain laws or putting into into place certain laws in the 19th century that start protecting the rights of lower class people that that though that they can placate or or smooth over any conflicts that might be boiling up and britain came awfully darn close to their own revolution about 30 years after the 40 years after the french revolution just after the napoleonic wars end um in 18 about 1820 or 30 the british are on the verge of of a revolution and it's only really by the grace of luck that they managed to make it through without an entire revolution breaking out in london but um we'll get to that another time after uh second semester starts anyway um only the eldest son this is called primogeniture primogeniture where the eldest son is risen to peerage what risen to peerage means was um if you think about what peers are right when we talk about your peers we talk about people who are of your same status and peerage meant that um you were raised to the same status of nobility you inherited the formal title of duke earl uh, whatever of um viscount count of whatever territory that you control from your father um and and i want to also mention that the british nobility was a pretty exclusive group of people they were the smallest they were the wealthiest um uh, aristocracy or i'm sorry that should say the well smallest smallest and wealthiest aristocrats in europe i guess you could call it an aristocracy because really an aristocracy for those of you that are wondering crassy or ocracy is a um, typically a suffix to a word that we would use to describe a type of government like democracy or theocracy an aristocracy as you can imagine is a type of government that is run by aristocrats um, or wealthy landowners and so i guess in that sense you really could call parliament or british you know the the, the government in um in britain in terms of how it it is executed uh, is an aristocracy, although it would be more proper to call it a constitutional monarchy. Um, here is actually the Irish House of Commons in like the late 1700s. Um, French nobility. There were 400,000 nobles divided between nobles of the sword and nobles of the robe. So I don't remember how much there were of each, but if you combine nobles of the sword and robe, that's 400,000 nobles in France. That's a lot of nobles. Um, and they mostly cooperated during this time. There had been times where nobles of the sword and nobles of the robe didn't get along very well, but during the 1700s, during the 18th century, um, they, they pretty much support each other because both of them are interested in keeping their privileges. Neither of them want to pay any taxes. Neither of them want to lose their political power. There was, though, a divide in nobility between some people who had better favor with the royal court at Versailles. And of course, the royal court at Versailles refers to, when we say the royal court, I'm not talking about like the Supreme Court or something like that. I'm talking about the court, the king's court, the men who, the inner circle of the king, the people who served the king during this time, whether that be Louis the 14th, 15th, or eventually Louis the 16th. Um, other nobles weren't as close, particularly nobles of the sword who lived in southern France um, were not very close with the king. And although they might have been quite wealthy and controlled a, a lot of land, the thing is, is if you weren't in, your, in the king's inner circle at Versailles, you had a tendency to basically be a, a noble in name only. And otherwise, you may as well have been considered a peasant by the king. Maybe not. Maybe that's an exaggeration, but you may as well have been considered a nobody by the king, because um, if you're not close with him, he's not going to do any favors with for you. Um, whether you were close to the king or not, though, basically nobles paid almost nothing in taxes. Um, they were exempt or, or or left out of, not included 
from what was known as the tie uh, or the land tax, the tie. And I know that looks like tailies or something like that, but it's pronounced tie. Um, and they only rarely played this, uh, paid this, this uh, tax called the Vintiem. And the Vintiem was an income tax of sorts uh, that, that really, if they were made to pay it, they probably didn't even have to pay the whole thing. It was, that's kind of, most of the time they didn't have to pay it. The other thing that nobles didn't have to do were these things called corvées. Uh, the corvée was forced labor uh, that they made peasants do several times a year, uh, for, I mean, several days out of the year, uh, once a year, where basically it was forced labor where they made them do work. Um, and of course, nobility is not going to do that. But one of the things that the French nobility did have in common with the British nobles was that they did collect rent and dues from the tenants who lived on their land. And of course, the tenants that I'm referring to are the peasants who live on their land um, and other people, too. Sometimes middling class folks lived on the land that um, nobles owned as well. OK, I'm going to pause it there uh, and I'm going to check to see if we have any uh, questions. <laughs> rule Britannia, Britannia rules the waves. Um, you know, uh, that's a good question. Um, I'm going to put it back on, what you call it, view right now. Where's my, oh, here it is. Okay. So, um, would it be accurate to say rule Britannia, Britannia rules the waves? Uh, that's actually a cool question because um, what that's asking about is military power. I do love, in fact, let me show you something really fast here. Um, that was Samir that asked that. I actually have a book here called To Rule the Waves. And I don't know if that makes me like a huge dork or what, but um, To Rule the Waves, it's kind of a, it's not the best historical book, but it's a good read. Um, anyway. <clears throat> The British, uh, by the 1700s, basically do rule the do rule the waves. The French Navy is nothing to sneeze at, though they're quite powerful in their own right. But by 1707, um, the British Royal Navy has elevated itself above the um, Dutch Navy. The Dutch Navy, you know, kind of loses those wars against France, um, and they actually they win the war. I should say they win the wars against France. They lose the long run though because they it weakens them tremendously. And there's a number of Anglo-Dutch wars that happen. And um, so by the mid 1700s, yeah, basically Britain does rule the waves. That's not to say though that they have the most powerful military. You might argue that the French or even for their size, the Prussians have a much more powerful land military than do the British. Um, LOL OMG, Mr. Knight, that's so bad. I'm assuming that's referring to the prom joke that I made a moment ago. Um, was family business restricted to middle class or were there a few of the lower class doing family businesses? Uh, it depends on what you call lower class. Definitely peasantry wanted opportunities to make more money and they live in those cottages and do those types of jobs. So you would see low, quote unquote lower class people when I was talking about the putting out system earlier where cities would take and send orders off to um, cottages, cottage industry, uh, where you know poorer families were looking for a way to supplement their income because they had such little access to wealth at this time and they're you know being asked to do more work and they're being displaced from their lands and so on, that they're looking for anything that they can do to supplement their income. So. Um, I wouldn't say that it was restricted to middle classes only. I would say that basically anyone who was looking to make a little bit of extra dollars here or there would would have done a family type business. I can tell you the people who do not do a family business are the nobles. Um, why are there mostly animals of some sorts, mainly cats or dogs in most of these pictures? I mean, there's much of the part of the, why do you include, you know, people send out Christmas cards of their cats to people. Okay, that's maybe only me that does that. But, you know, people in the, you know, you've got the family dog in the picture and stuff like, I mean, people, they, as much today as back in those times, they, they considered animals as part of their daily lives and animals are around and you're going to paint things that are around. So, um, I mean, that's probably why they're included. At least that's my best guess. 
Um, as far as the questions over here goes, it says, um, even though the monarch in Britain didn't have that much power, did they control any land? That's a really good question. Um, did they control any land? I mean, yes and no. While they might not have been, while they might not have been directly responsible for the day-to-day -day of operations of whatever said land that they controlled, the fact of the matter is that the the nobles answer to the king, particularly in old school Britain or old school England, right? The king is considered, even though he doesn't have any real political authority anymore, um, they don't have a whole, the king doesn't have a tremendous amount of influence in parliament by the time that we get to the late 18th century, the king is still considered a social superior. And, and the British really very much respected that. Um, all the way through, I just got done writing this thesis on Napoleon, or not Napoleon, on Nelson, uh, Horatio Nelson, who was a great um, sea commander um, in the British Royal Navy. And, uh, you know, even when, when guys like him uh, had the opportunity to be elevated to peerage, that's that term that I used before, which he never actually ended up getting the opportunity to be elevated to peerage. He got the most he got was a foreign title. But I mean, he very, very much respected the king. He respected the king's son, who was a good friend of his, a guy by the name of uh, um, the, uh, now I'm totally blanking, the Duke of uh, Clarence, the Duke of Clarence. Um, Anyway, Prince William Henry was his name. But the point is to say that they were, I mean, they very much respected the social elevation. So did they control any land? Not really, but they controlled it in the sense that people who owned the land still saw the king as a superior. And so in that sense, they did. Um, didn't, you, didn't nobles use white lead to make themselves paler? Maybe. I, I'm, I know that makeup uh, is a product of nobility, and so um, the only people who would have used makeup at this time would have been people who were nobles. Um, I, I don't know. I couldn't answer that one. I don't remember. Uh, all right. That basically covers it. Um, what is your opinion on the Scottish independence vote out of curiosity? That's a good thing. What Samir is talking about, um, I'll. I'll I won't dedicate a lot of time to answering this. What Samir is talking about is that about a year ago, um, there was a vote for Scotland to remove itself from Great Britain, um, and the vote ended up failing. So Scotland, in other words, Scotland re was retained as part of Great Britain. <clears throat> I'm not, personally, I'm not in favor of it. Um, I have my own opinions as to why I'm not in favor of it, but I think culturally there, I don't really have a major opinion one way or another, but I will say that culturally, I don't think that it is in their interest for Scotland to remove themselves from the identity of Great Britain, even if it's a nominal thing, meaning in name only. Um, I just don't think it's in their favor. I think that if they ever get to a, a point um, where, where they feel like it is truly in their favor to separate from, um, from the you know, the unity of Great of, of Great Britain, I they will probably do that. But I, I think the reason that it failed is because, frankly, most people in Scotland don't really feel like separating themselves from it. I think their histories are pretty well enmeshed by this point after 300 some years of being intertwined together. Um, can you show us Harrison? I would, but I'm not going to go searching for him. If he's, if he, he comes by, I'll hold him up, but otherwise I'm not I'm not gonna go. He's probably sleeping, so that's what he spends most most of his days doing. All right, I'm gonna finish this out here and um, we'll be done. Okay, I gotta move a little bit quicker too. So here we go. Eastern European nobility. Eastern Europe, European nobility was generally more repressive of the lower classes, meaning they did not treat them very nicely. They, they put them down more. For instance, in Poland, nobles were 100% free of having to pay any taxes whatsoever until 1741. 
And might I add, they possessed right of life or death over serfs. So if, if ever you were wondering, how come the serfs have it worse than peasants? It's because in Eastern Europe, where serfdom is retained, um, the serfs are treated extremely poorly. And even just a, a minor screw up on behalf of a serf could cost him his life. Um, most Polish nobility were, were actually pretty poor, especially by comparison to like French or British nobility. Um, but even though they were nobility, they, that still meant that they had power over the serfs of the land that they lived on. Um, now, I will say, though, that there were a few rich families that basically held all of the political power in Poland. But for the most part, Polish nobility, particularly in comparison to other places, was pretty poor. Um, what about Austria and Hungary? Uh, nobility had basically the most judicial power through the manorial courts in those places. Um, as we all know, the Habsburgs were running Austria still at this point. Um, and they were also too very much exempt from taxation. Uh, in Prussia, uh, nobility basically became stronger under Frederick the Great. Um, the noble class in Prussia are known as the Junkers. I know that looks like Junkers. Um, it's the Junkers, and the Junkers um, were always so used um, whenever they selected officers for the military. So you have two, rank, two types of people in the military. You have what you would call like your enlisted folks, okay, <clears throat> and you have your officers. And so the people who enlist, for instance, in the United States military, if you just graduate from high school and you go enlist, you do enlist, you don't start off as an officer. You start off as like a, I don't know even what it is. You start off as like a, a grunt type person, a person who is, you go through basic training and you're basically thrown into the lowest ranks of the military. Um, officers are um, historically in a lot of places in Europe, always going to be selected from nobility all the way up until the late 1700s when you start to see people who are kind of a middling class being selected for officer positions and i will say too that um, one of the first people to really select officers based on how skilled they were in the battlefield uh, was napoleon napoleon was known for basically saying i really could care less whether you're nobility or not um, i want a person who's going to be able to command people effectively on the on the you know, in, in a time of war and on the battlefield. So, um, but at this time in Prussia, if you're a military officer, you're, that means you're also going to be uh, from the Junker class and they make up the political bureaucracy of, of Prussia as well. Um, this is a concert in 1700. That's such a beautiful painting. I decided to include it in there. Again, not something that you would have ever found peasants at. Um, and then you have nobility in Russia. Now, nobility in Russia is slightly different than nobility in anywhere else in Europe because Russia actually historically did not have a history of a noble class. You did have the boyars basically who gained their political power through Peter the Great, but there really wasn't historically a quote unquote class of nobility or aristocracy in Russia. They're kind of, they kind of march to the beat of their own drum. Um, but Peter the Great basically linked together state service and noble social status through the table of ranks. So from uh, 1722 onwards, nobility starts to resist any type of compulsory state service. And compulsory state service might have been in the military, it might have been in various other capacities, but basically compulsory means you're required to do it. State service means, of course, you're serving the state in some ma manner, one way or another. And nobility really does not want to have to do that. The boyars start to see themselves as an entitled, wealthy class who should not have to um, do you know, compulsory mandatory service. So by 1785, under Catherine the Great, there's something called the Charter of the Nobility which basically legally defines the rights and privileges of noble men and women in return for voluntary state service. So they were no longer compulsory state service, but your rights and privileges became defined based upon the amount of voluntary work that you were willing to do. Um, and they held lots of power over serfs, 
and they also were not taxed. So you're noticing this trend of nobility basically having a lot of power over the serfs in Eastern Europe and also not having to be taxed. That's a boyar in the background. Okay, <clears throat> there's a period of time, starting when the Enlightenment really takes off, where uh, the aristocrats um, start to feel that their social standing and their political and economic privileges are threatened. So <clears throat> there's this period of thing, there's this thing that happens called the aristocratic resurgence. And what the aristocratic resurgence was, was an attempt by the aristocrats, by the nobles, to make sure that they retain every single, and perhaps even gain, not only retain, hold on to, but to gain or expand their social position and their privileges. So how do they do that? Well, one of the ways that they try to resurge themselves or you know, become stronger or retain their rights and privileges is to make it harder to become a noble in the first place. Another way that they attempt to um, hold on to their social standing was that they, they really pushed, nobility was pushing very strong by the mid 1700s to reserve all military, church, government positions to be held by higher ranking nobles. So they don't want to open the door for, for even lesser nobles or for certainly not for middling class folks to hold higher ranking positions in the military, higher ranking positions in government or higher ranking positions in the church. <clears throat> Another way that they attempt to hold on to their social position and privileges was that they attempted to use the authority of existing noble controlled institutions against the power of the monarchies. So who's the threat to the nobility? Well, the monarchy is because what the monarchy does in a lot of cases, particularly in absolutist France, is it tries to separate the nobles from the um, you, from the nobil from the monarchs by using bureaucracies. And the nobility weren't stupid; they knew what was happening. So what they do is they use these noble-controlled institutions like parlements in France or the British Parliament or provincial diets of Germany. And what those, what those noble controlled institutions do is they prevent the power of the monarch expanding bureaucracies and things like that, or at least they attempt to do that. And then they tried also finally to improve their financial position. And, and where the nobles are most successful in improving their financial position without question is in Britain um, <clears throat> because of all of those enclosures and things that I was talking about today. Um, they fight for fewer taxes. They fight for higher rent from the um, peasants that live on their land, the tenants. Um, they fight to collect long forgotten dues from peasants. And where the, where the nobility is panicking the most by the time the mid to late 1700s roll around is in France. Because the, you know, keep in mind, because in France, so many, there, first of all, there were tons and tons of nobles. And many of them paid to get into that position up front. And this was a long-term dumb decision by Louis XIV because what it eventually resulted in was that there were a lot of really wealthy people in France who you could not collect taxes from. And this put tremendous amounts of pressure on, on uh, peasantry. And so um, what the nobility do is they start to feel the pressure from the king to pay taxes. Well, of course the nobles don't wanna pay taxes. So what the nobles try to do to make up for that is to go through like medieval codes, if you know, four or 500 year old laws to collect these long forgotten dues that haven't been collected for centuries from peasants. And the reason that they do that is to prevent themselves from having to pay any new taxes or to start paying taxes. All right, and that's like a little peasant um, festival that they're having there. All right, let's talk about the position of peasants and serfs at this time um, really quickly. Peasants, as you, I'm sure you could imagine, if they're not collecting taxes from nobility, that doesn't leave a whole lot of other groups of people to collect taxes from. The church doesn't pay much in taxes. The nobles don't pay much in taxes. So who are you going to collect taxes from? Well, the brunt of that falls onto the peasants. Now, peasants in France had two major things that they had to pay banalities, which were these old feudal dues, 
for the use of the Lord's land, using their mill, using their ovens. And banalities were, were basically, you know, things that it's like almost like it's like a fee that you pay. It's almost like it, you guys probably don't know anything about this, but there's these things that you, if you ever buy a house one day, particularly if you buy like a condo, um, there's a, these, these things out there called association dues. And what it is, is it's a tax basically that you are charged by the organization or the neighborhood that you live in to use things like the pool or use things like the parks or the upkeep of the neighborhood or the social code of the neighborhood, not to paint your front door red or, you know, hang a bunch of crazy ornaments on your house during Halloween or whatever it is that make the neighborhood look worse. And so <clears throat> banalities are those types of taxes where basically you're paying your landlord to provide you the use of various things on the Lord's land. Then I talked to you earlier about the corvée, uh, the forced labor for a number of days each year for French peasants. Um, in in Austria, where the Habsburgs were, the Habsburg serfs had this thing called robot. I know that looks like robot, and the words are, in fact, very much linked. If you think about a, what a robot does, a robot does menial tasks that, you know, humans don't really want to do, and robots are, you know, the purpose of robots are to serve man, right? And it brings up a very interesting episode of uh, um, the Twilight Zone. Oh, shoot, I forgot to put it over into screen mode. That's all right, though, but whatever. Here, I'll show you the last couple of slides. Um, the robot, if you think about the, um, the, the, object of a of a robot right where you've got a robot that's like doing menial tasks and you know it's repetitive and it's just kind of stupid labor that's exactly what the robot was in habsburg austria was basically this type of like menial labor that they were expected to do just because they served their lords that's really so the term robot, in case you were wondering, like robotics, or they invented it for robots, like when they started creating machines. No, they take it. They took it from that term, robot. Um, anyway, let me uh, look and see if we have any. What you call it? Um, are we supposed to be seeing your screen? Yes, I'll show it to you in just a second. All right, here we go. I'll. Um, I'll put the PowerPoint up right again here. Uh, sorry about that. Okay, so here was the uh, here was the one with the with the painting that I said was so beautiful. It's it's a concert actually. Um, this is a harpsichord. If you look really, really, really closely at this, you can see that. The keys are black. Uh, the piano keys are black, and the black keys are white on this. And that's an indicator that it's actually a harpsichord rather than a piano. Um, and then you've got a small little quintet here who's playing. Uh, all right, and then you've got the boyar here. There's your Russian boyar. And then you've got your um, peasant what you call it, your peasant class or peasant party festival thing here, small community. Here's the dog, dogs, cats. All right. Um, and here was the other slide about the banalities, the corvée, the Habsburg serfs, robot. And then really quickly, just to finish up talking about this, Russian serfs, the worst off, the serfs who were the worst off by a long shot were in Russia. Serfs were viewed as economic commodities, much the same way that slaves were viewed as economic commodities because they were tied to the land. And so there was a certain depersonalized factor, depersonalization factor that happened with Russian serfs and they were treated just terribly oppressively. They could be punished, killed or exiled with absolutely no legal recourse. At least if you were a peasant in France or, or, or England or something, you had some sort of like recourse there was some expectation that the law worked in kind of a predictable fashion, even if sometimes there were kind of cruel or unusual punishments for people, at least it was like predictable. But 
um, there was absolutely no grounds for any sort of legal recourse for, for Russian serfs. They very much were basically the same as slaves in, in some sense. And there's some serfs for you. This is a more recent picture. This is not a picture from the 1700s. This is a painting probably from the early 1900s. Um, <clears throat> peasants were better protected um, in Europe throughout the 18th century in some sense because labor was in high demand. That's in every place except for Britain. I don't think that peasants, I wouldn't say that peasants were very well protected in Britain. Peasants could end up in just abject poverty in Britain by the late 1700s because of the fact that you have the enclosure movement that is displacing more and more and more peasants um, and putting them into the cities and having them work longer hours. And so, um, you know, peasants, peasants were not super well protected prior to this, but um, in certain places in Europe, peasants become very well protected because they're a hot commodity. You want peasants to be able to work the land, particularly in places where the agricultural revolution was kind of slow to get off the ground. And so you were stuck using kind of older labor methods. Um, peasants who felt that their traditional rights were threatened or overly oppressed did have a tendency to rebel. And the most famous of these uh, rebellions was known as the Pugashev Rebellion or the Pugachev Rebellion. And it was the largest peasant upri uprising of the 18th century. It happened, of course, in Russia. Um, Pugashev is a Russian name. And it happened under Catherine the Great. Now, under Catherine the Great, who we think of as an absolute um, enlightened despot, the thing about uh, Catherine the Great's enlightened despot rule is that Catherine the Great talked a good game when it came to serfs, but when it actually, you know, came to walking the walk instead of just talking the talk, the serfs were treated terribly under Catherine the Great. They lost privileges, if anything. So there was this guy, Emilian, Emilian Pugachev or Pugachev, who um, promised the serfs land um, and of their freedom of from their lords. Well, that didn't happen, and Emilian um, Pugashev was killed uh, in 1775, and the response to the Pugachev Rebellion was to treat the serfs even worse than they were being treated prior to the rebellion. So it was a brutal suppression of the serfs, um, and that basically closed the, the door for any, uh, you know, talks about improving the serfs' conditions for another 25 years. Um, the, they were reminded in, a, in the harshest way possible uh, where, what their social standing was and just how little rights or privileges that they had. So um, Russian serfs really, really, really had it very bad. Um, the game laws. I talked about this earlier. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this. English landowners, um, because of the game laws, had the right to hunt um, animals like hares, pheasants, deer. And the game laws were no joke, man, because if you were a peasant, I mean, I was joking about it a little bit today, but if you were a peasant and you got caught killing a deer on a noble's land, you could be executed for it. It was a capital punishment. Um, so it was not a joke. It was a very serious manner um, in the 18th century. Why did they do that, you might ask? Why did they want to limit the thing, the lives of the peasants so much? The reason they wanted to do it was exactly the thing that I told you about before, which is that whole aristocratic resurgence thing. They felt a threat. They felt threatened by the diminishing of their status as nobility. So they were instituting laws. It's almost a prime example of a type of law that's passed meant to reestablish the the you know nobles status um, as being dominant or superior to all of the other classes. So they passed this law thinking to themselves, well, we will make the things that peasants like doing illegal. We'll put a limit on their leisure time activities because leisure time leads the peasants to be even lazier than they already are. Well, what this, of course, leads to, much the same way that um, prohibition, for those of you that are aware of what prohibition is, it's when um, in the United States we made alcohol illegal. 
Well, the fact of the matter is, is that there's a lot of people that really like using alcohol in their leisure time. And so what this means is that once you make it illegal, the behaviors don't change, the mental attitudes don't change. So people now start committing crimes, quote unquote, not that their behaviors have changed, they're doing the same things, but now it's a crime that they're doing it. So now they're criminals. Uh, And so the poor folks, the peasants who are becoming even poorer because of these types of laws that are being passed, like the enclosure acts and the game laws and all these other things, now resort to poaching these animals. So they're killing them and they sell the animals and their furs and their meat and various other things on on like basically a black market of sorts. They start selling it and making a profit because it's illegal. So much the same way the bootleggers, and this is a great, again, if you're wondering what I'm doing here, I'm synthesizing. I'm using a modern day example to draw a connection between, between two things that seem like they don't relate, right? This is what synthesis is. I'm, I'm telling you about the game laws. Who would have ever thought that the game laws related to 1920s prohibition laws? Well, they do in the sense that it makes people criminals for doing an act that they enjoy doing, which is in this case, hunting. And there's a little um, political cartoon about the game laws. Here's the king with the sword and a poor noble who's gotten caught hunting a hare. Here's Harrison. That's what that is. That's Harrison right there. All right, here we go. Um, that's a joke. Uh, <laughs> I'm the only one that gets to hear people laughing at my joke when I'm doing these things, so I'll just shut up. All right, families. Um, the household was the basic unit of production and consumption at this time. And as I was telling you about Uh, Most families lived in rural areas at this time. Um, And during this time, we see what's called the the family economy, where each person has a very specific role in the house in maintaining the family business. Let me give you a picture of what the typical Northwestern European household looked like. Um, It's not this picture in the background, but I'll tell you what the typical Northwestern European household. When I say Northwest Europe, I mean Britain, France, low countries, maybe Prussia, if we're including them in there. Um, <clears throat> you had a married couple, man and a woman. Um, not to say that homosexuality didn't happen at this time. Certainly it did, particularly amongst the aristocrats. But generally speaking, most people were married. Um, they had a couple of kids, at least three or four kids, um, and then possibly some servants. And when I say servants, I don't mean people that they had that lived in the home with them necessarily. Well, they might have lived in the home temporarily with them. But servants were people who were hired to work for the head of household. So servants are not like, oh, I own you and you're indentured to me. It's a contract. So they would sign a predetermined, that servants, domestic servants would sign a predetermined contract between the head of household and the servant that said the type of work that they would be doing, what they would be paid, they were paid, um, and if they would live there or not, and various things like that. So, But generally speaking, the only way that you're going to have servants is if you have enough money to pay them. So certainly not um, all people had servants, but, but a good number of people did. Um, rarely, though, did more than two generations live in the same home. And you might be surprised by this, because we think of ourselves as being so modern today with our you know, getting married late and all this stuff. But believe it or not, in a lot of Northwestern European countries at this time, and I am specifically saying Northwestern Europe, this does not include Russia, this does not include um, Poland or places like that. Um, in, in a lot of places in Northwestern Europe, men didn't get married until about 26 and women didn't get married until 23. Now, that's maybe still a little bit early by modern day standards. Okay, you might be married by 23, but there's an awful lot of women that are pushing off getting married until, you know, 26, 27, somewhere in that area today. But in this time, you you might be kind of surprised by these numbers. You might have thought, oh, women are getting married at 16 and having kids and stuff like that. In Eastern Europe, possibly, but in Western Europe, probably not. And because of the high mortality rate and the late marriages, high mortality, particularly of infants, Um, and late marriages of adults, um, you're not going to see three generations living in the house together too often. Um, Because typically men and women at this time, when they got married, to be honest with you, the woman was probably already pregnant by the time that she got married in a lot of cases. Um, But having your first child at 26, 28, you know, is, is pretty late in life 
at, particularly in this time. And, um, and that means that if your baby survives, um, that, you know, you're going to be off on your own by the time that you have it. It's not, you're not going to see three generations living in the same house. Uh, meaning grandma's not going to be living with mom and child and great grandchild and so on and so forth. Children left their home a lot of times too um, in their early teens at this point. When I say children, what I mean is like kids 13, 14, 15 years old. And the reason that they left their house was to work with other young servants. And this was called neo-localism, where kids leave the house to work for um, other servants or work with other servants. Um, and get some work experience, establish themselves, and potentially build their own, establish their new own household. So this is how things worked during this time. So by the time that you were about 25, 28 years old as a man, it was pretty much expected that you were independent, you had established your own house, you were married and probably had a kid or two. But um, don't think that that happened at like 18 or something. They, 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 that was more typical of Eastern Europe which is what this slide is about. And this happens to also be the last slide. So typical Eastern European household, men and women married before age 20. So they married quite a bit earlier than in Western Europe. Um, children were born to much younger parents. Um, so, you know, men and women, if they're married before 20, that means that typically they've got a child before 20. Um, it was not uncommon, especially among serfs, that wives were actually older than their husbands, which is totally backwards of what Western Europe was. Oftentimes, the wives would be several years younger than their husbands in Western Europe. Um, generally, too, the, the, houser, the households were much larger in Eastern Europe. So whereas in Western, Northwestern Europe, you might have had six people living in the home, including your servants seven people living in the home, eight people maybe. Um, you've got between nine and 20 people living in the same house. Um, that's really cramped living situation. And a lot of times households expanded rather than the kids moving out and becoming established in their own home. So in, in Eastern Europe, it's a very different story. You do have several generations, grandma, maybe even great grandma, all the way down to infants living in the same home together um, and, and there were a lot of restrictions of serfs, particularly um, getting married. Landlords, because the serfs were tied to the land, if a woman married a husband from a different landlord, that meant that the woman got transferred over to the, to the competitor landlord's land. Clearly, the landlords do not want that happening. So what happens is a lot of intermarriage between local families starts to happen um, in Eastern Europe, particularly in Russia and Poland, where serfs marry other um, families of serfs who all live on the same landlord's estate. Um, it also might require uh, widows and widowers to remarry to make sure that the plot of land that they live on was properly tended to. So that brings us to the end of our little deal here. Um, Let's see here. Uh-oh. Did you guys get things frozen? Can you hear me? Uh-oh. Hopefully you can hear all this. All right. Well, I will um, go back to this.